Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a private meeting with the President of the United States? I have for a long time, and recently I had the opportunity to have a one-hour private meeting with the most powerful man of the world. I'd like to give you an overview of how this all took place, how the invite was extended, what I did to prepare, things I should have done to prepare, and a little bit about the experience, just for those of you who are curious about the, the day, how it went. Recently, I received a text from a friend of mine who was part of the most recent administration. And he sent me a text that said, hey, Rick, the president will be in Houston and he's had some time for a private meeting. Would you be interested in meeting him? And you could bring your wife and a friend. And I said, of course, I would be interested in meeting the president. And so he texted me some details about that. And it was gonna happen, I believe it's three or four days in advance. Now that's not very much time to prepare to meet the most powerful person in the world. But it was one of those things that you had to take advantage of. Just to back up a little bit, a few months prior to that, I was invited to go play golf with this very same former president, Trump. And I was invited to go play in an eight some 18 holes. Now, that sounds really, really great to everyone, right? You'd be riding in a golf cart with the president driving and you'd spend nine holes with them and then he would move to the different golf cart and spend another nine holes with them. That sounds fantastic. Only that I took a vow against playing golf years ago so that I could spend more time with my family and my company. And so one of the things that I had to do was I had to turn down the invitation to go play golf with this very same president a few months ago. And that had been eating on me for a long time that I should have gone, I should have embarrassed myself with my play. I should have at least gotten out there and spent some time with the president. And so thank God I got a text from this friend a few months later and said, hey Rick, let's, let's set up a meeting. So the president was coming to town to speak at an event and we were gonna have a private room off to the side uh, in this venue. And so it was three or four days before the event, not very much time to prepare. And so I became very, very concerned about all the preparation needed to go into this event because you don't just wear any old suit, any old jacket. You don't just say any old words. And also you have the element of bringing your wife and then also a friend along with you. Who do you pick? Those are some of the big questions there. So I started thinking about the magnitude of the situation. I started thinking about, you know, if we each know maybe 10,000 people throughout our lifetime. How many of those 10,000 people have ever even seen a US president in person, let alone shaking their hand? 100 maybe, maybe 200? And then from those 200, how many people have actually had a conversation with the president? 20 or 30? And of those 20 or 30, how many people have actually had a private meeting with the president? Five or 10 maybe? So looking at your network, maybe it was. this is the way it was for me, there were five or 10 people that I had known that I had met that had even ever had a private meeting with the president. And so that, that gave me a little bit of awe and a little bit of pause about the, the importance of the moment to have this pri private meeting with the president. And so I began to think about how do I prepare for this? How do you prepare for the day? And the ladies, this is more difficult for you, so I'll speak from the man's point of view. And I, and I would say for the ladies that are watching that, if you've ever dreamt of going and buying that five or $10,000 Chanel professional jacket, this is the time to go do that. This is the time to break out the credit card and go do that. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And you wanna look as sharp and as lovely as you do every other time of the year. But for us men, we have to decide what we're gonna wear. And so I begin to look around a little bit and, and the obvious choice is to wear a dark suit. Now, you can go with the black suit, you can go with the dark blue suit. I chose to go with a blended suit, which is a blue-gray suit, all a, a, a navy-esque type of color. So it's, the suit is actually a woven fabric of both navy and gray. And so I began to think about ties and shirts. Obviously, you wanna go with a straight collared shirt. You wanna go with a very, very solid pattern, maybe some pinstripes in the shirt and very, very low key, solid tie. Now the key for you gentlemen is to remember that the pictures that are gonna be taken that day, you'll see those pictures for the rest of your life. And you'll probably only get one shot at this picture. There'll be one snap if you get a great picture on this day, if you even have the opportunity to get a picture, and that picture will not only be in your house, but it'll probably be in your kids, maybe even your grandkids' house, out on some picture frame in some random room for a long time. So you wanna look sharp. And so this is where everything really plays a role. And not only the suit, not only the tie, with the perfect dimple, by the way, you've gotta have the perfect dimple. The clean, very conservative shirt and the solid shoes. Now, one of my, my friends and I had this back and forth about, about what kind of shoes to wear. It was Tony Busby, the great fashion icon of, uh, of Texas, I like to call him. 
and uh, I had this debate about whether to wear leather shoes or to wear a more exotic, darker shoe, maybe maybe a alligator or maybe a um, another type of, of animal. And uh, we decided that that traditional dark leather shoes would be the most appropriate for the occasion because it's not a matter of you're meeting a person, it's a matter of respect for the actual office. And so no matter what party affiliation you might be from or someone that just disavows both parties, I think the respect for the office is something that's superintendent of the event, right alone the actual personality of the person that you're meeting. So out of respect for the office, I chose the, the unexciting dark brown leather loafer. And so this gives you a little bit of an attire of what I wore. Hopefully this will help the 10 of you who get a chance to meet the president in private and, and be prepared for that day. Now, one of the things also we have to keep in mind is the president, if you're meeting in private with him, will wanna have a conversation, right? These guys are masterful communicators. You think about Clinton, you think about Obama, you think about George W. Bush, you think about Reagan. They were masters of the small group. They were great on stage, but personally, they made you feel valued. They made you feel important. They made you feel like they really wanted to deep dive into your soul and know you as a person. And this is why men like that ascend to the presidency is because they're able to relate very, very quickly. And Trump was no exception to that. So one of the things we had to do is prepare what we we're gonna say. Now, I'm not smart enough to know that. I'm not smart enough to think about that. I did not realize that until the day of, and I'll tell you a little bit about this in a second, that I should prepare what to say. And also, I should be prepared to be thankful for the occasion. I was thankful I prepared to thank the president for certain economic bills he passed, certain uh, defensive measures, certain instances where he could have taken overt military action. He chose to withhold the resources and save potentially a lot of American lives. I came prepared to thank him for those things, but I didn't think about the other counter questions that he may ask given we'd have an hour together. And so let's talk about the day of. The day The day arrives and we arrive two hours before the planned meeting time at this, this stadium. It was at the Toyota Center in Houston. And so my wife and I arrive, we go through security and we're immediately met by an escort that then takes us to go meet Secret Service. Now Secret Service, we've dealt with them a few different times. They are fantastic ladies and gentlemen. They're very professional. And I assure you, they know who you are before you arrive. That you give them your first and last name, city of birth, generally country, of a birth and maybe one other identifying piece of information and they know who you are. We've actually hosted other events at our place with Secret Service Protection and they are impressive. They run rehearsals, they are really, really great and they also know everyone who's gonna attend and they've done their due diligence on those individuals. So they're fantastic folks. So they, they lead us up into this private room. Now, the day of there's a massive storm. So Air Force One or Air Force Two or whatever it's called that day is flying in from Florida I believe, and he's flying into the Houston area and there's massive storms. So the president is forced to be diverted to Beaumont, which is about an hour and a half away. What this also means is the motorcade that's pre-staged at the airport in Houston has to drive another hour, hour and a half to go pick up the president at this other airport. And so it's a, it's a huge change of plans. So not only do they have to drive out there to pick him up, they then have to drive the hour and a half back to get him here. And it, one funny thing was Bill O'Reilly, who was scheduled to moderate, to, to hold the conversation with him, also had to be diverted to Beaumont. And he arrived in Beaumont, and one of the guys in the room was texting back and forth and calling Bill O'Reilly, if you remember this this old Fox News uh, commentator, just a, just a really, really interesting guy. And Bill O'Reilly says, can't you guys send a, a limo for me? Can't you send something for me to be able to, to, be able to get there in time? And Bill O'Reilly had to take an Uber from Beaumont to Houston. Now, if you know anything about Beaumont, these are not like Uber Blacks. These are Uber Ubers that he had a ride in. And so the funniest thing was having Bill O'Reilly text and call this guy that was sitting next to me the entire time, giving him a play-by-play -play about what he's passing, what he's, what he's thinking. He's not a happy camper about this, but he finally makes it there as well to, to interview the president. And so the president flies in, comes in, and it's now somewhere around five hours late. And so we've been waiting around a while. We've been there now close to six, seven hours. We've got some other folks there that are hanging out with us. Don Trump Jr.'s there. Some of the other folks from the administration are hanging out. We're having lunch, we're chatting, we're, we're just catching up on, on things. One of the older guys that's in the room says, hey, where's the restroom? We get, we've got to use the restroom. And so I, I go with him to go find the restroom and Secret Service says, I want you to go in there and go use that restroom right there. So me and this guy, we walk into this restroom. We're thinking, just a regular restroom. We walk in this men's room that's at the stage. So this is a larger men's room. Walk in and the men's room is filled 
with men in the full military gear. I'm talking about camo, bulletproof vests, assault rifles. They're wearing battle helmets and they got the night vision up. And there's like 20 or 30 of them in this bathroom, which is crazy because I didn't see a single one of them around. You just saw the regular Secret Service and city police and county and, and more localized law enforcement. But man, when we walked in that restroom, they were there in force. And it was, it was some of the funniest things because they all had their night vision cameras on the recording in the restroom. And so we had some great banner with those guys and, and left them there. But that was, that, was pretty, that was pretty cool seeing all those guys just like they're pre-staged for something, something goes down, they're ready to go. And I'm sure that wasn't the only restroom full of those sorts of gentlemen and, and those, sorts of, uh, those sorts of gear and, and preparations being made. And so the president walks into the room. This is now seven hours after we've arrived and there are nine people in the room. Nine people in the room, plus the president. That's pretty amazing. And I'll, I'll put up some pictures that show you how this is set up. Now, the president is sitting at the head of a U-shaped table, sitting at the head. My wife is here next to him. So he is literally right there. She can, she can reach out and touch the president. And then I'm sitting next to her. And then my friend, business partner, is sitting next to me. And we've got some folks sitting across them. And then we have Secret Service. We've got a couple other guys in the room. So there are nine people in the room. And we spent an hour there just talking to him, just trying to feel about what his thoughts are. You know, specifically, are you gonna run for president again? Are you going to certainly, you know, try to revoke some of the actions of the current administration? What are your thoughts on the election? What are your thoughts on COVID? What are your thoughts on the economy of the Gulf industry? All these sorts of subjects we had a chance to speak about. Now, the go-to question for the president back to us is, tell me about yourself. What do you do? Yeah, that's a pretty wide ranging question. And you really don't have a good idea about how much time to spend on that. Tell me about yourself, what do you do? Now my wife is the is the expert and she told him about her work as a volunteer librarian at the church and some of the volunteer work that she does. And it was perfect, it was perfect. And he, he asked her a few other deep diving questions about what, what that involves, like with real books or with digital books, that, that sort of thing. And had a great series of questions for her about the kids, those sorts of things. And, and he moved on to me. What do you do? I said, I said, I'm in commercial real estate, Mr. President, just like you. And that was enough. That was enough. That, that's, that, that was the, that was the flag that this is a boring fella. And he does not have very much to say at all. Now we had a few other comments exchanged throughout the day, but that was pretty much my go-to answer. It could have been a little bit better, but I did have an opportunity to be able to thank him later on in the meeting for his work as president, didn't agree with everything he did, but he did some great economic work, specifically with the Tax Cut and Jobs Act that really stimulated the economy, stimulated our business, helped our employees. And I was able to share that appreciation as well. And so we spent an hour with the president, just dialoguing, just a regular guy. But I tell you what, when he walks in the room, when the most powerful person in the world at one time walks into the room wearing that blue suit, that red tie with those gigantic Secret Service agents, those mean looking guys, but very professional. Just the air gets sucked out of the room. It's just one of those things you can't believe you're there. Now, obviously you can't pick up your phone. You can't use your phone. You can't take pictures. They, they were able to allow us to take some pictures a little bit later on with their photographer and then get the photos afterwards. But it's one of those things that's highly, highly controlled. And so we had a great time with him. Very, very charismatic, very, very wise and the sorts of things that he did. Great with people. I mean, I wonder, and I would like to meet Obama and Clinton at some point to be able to find out what sort of personal charisma, personal charm they have on a one-on-one -on -one basis, because I'm just fascinated by the skill set that this one president had. And you know that Bill Clinton and Barack Obama have a little bit more of a charismatic bent rather than a more curmudgeonly type of thinker. I, I, I really I really put President Trump a little bit in the, the deep thinker category, despite his words with someone like a Dick Cheney, who maybe is just a, a brain that's very thoughtful about things, but then when he articulates it, it's very, very simplified. It's very simplified, very digestible for the masses. And this is one of the things that President Trump was able to articulate while we were together. And so I thought about what are the three things that it would be helpful for you to know in preparation for a big day like this? Because most of these big days, and I've had a number of these, these major days, I would, I would say over the past two or three years of meeting very, very important people, having really, really great experiences that are once in a lifetime opportunities to be 
at very important places with very, very important and good people, but it always comes at the last minute. It's always two or three or four or five days in advance. So how do you prepare for that? Number one, I would say is always maintain a great haircut, always have at least one or two go-to suits if you're a man, go-to outfits if you're a woman, great ties, great shoes, always polished, always be prepared for anything. And it'll be surprising to you who you actually bump into whenever you're ready to meet them. If you always walk around prepared, you will meet people that you never dreamed you'd be able to meet just walking on the street. I've met mayors, I've met people that are former cabinet members, I've met US senators and congressmen, I just people all over the place. I just bump into them because I happen to be in the right places because maybe I said yes to one other opportunity. And that's that's sort of a sub part here, a sub point. Always say yes. Get out of your comfort zone because getting out of your comfort zone, that gives you specific opportunities that no one else is able to capture. And so say yes. So you've got a great outfit ready to go. You're always prepared presentation wise. You're always prepared physically. And number two, I would say always know what you do. When the president asks you, what do you do? Be very specific about what you do and include something that is maybe a differentiator. I did not think about this. Now, obviously in the business world, I talk about differentiation in our in our various businesses. I'm able to articulate a little bit more of what that is in a, in a you know one sentence or a two sentence elevator pitch. But for the president, I threw that out the window and just said something plain and boring. And so that's one of the things if I had to go back and do, that's the one thing I would change is what I actually said that I did to become more interesting. And so always be prepared to give an answer about who you are and what you do. And think about this, because if you can't articulate who you are in short format, you'll never know who you are in an elongated format and be able to articulate who you are to others throughout your life. And so have a very, very brief synopsis about who you are, what you do. And the third thing, and this is what I was thinking the entire time when I was sitting in that room with nine other people and the president, I was thinking, I don't belong here. I do not belong here. This guy that grew up fairly poor, lower middle class poor, I guess, I don't belong here, but I had gratitude. I was thankful for the opportunity to be able to be in that room with those people and with one of the guys I think that pushed the economic success of our country forward more than anybody else had. And it was just a great opportunity. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And what you'll find is as you're more gratitude, you're more grateful, you have more gratitude and you start saying yes to more things. You start pushing the boundaries. You start asking for people to think about you next time there's an opportunity, that these opportunities will come more and more frequently, but you have to be prepared because the greatest opportunities have the shortest fuses and they may never come back around again.